Hi everyone, I'm Carlota Pico from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here today with Amy Kelly, who is EMEA Marketing Director at User Testing and has over eight years of experience in marketing and communications. Welcome, Amy, and thank you so much for joining us today on The Content Mix. Hi there, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. The pleasure is ours. I can't wait to learn about your experience. So to get this interview started off, I'd like to learn a little bit about your background, a bit about the company that you're currently working in, and also how you got into your current role. Sure, yeah. So as as you said, I've been in marketing for just around eight, nine years. And it's been a mixture of in-brand and in-agency. So I started my career in agencies and working in creative PR and sustainability agencies. And then I actually got into the contract world, which sort of opened up the doors and got me really into working with some fantastic brands. So my first opportunity in the brand side was with ITV. And following that, I did... Uh, a project at YouTube, which was great. Following that, I moved to Facebook and I was there for a year. So I had been down in London for, I think, around like seven and a half years. Uh, so I was there for a while. And during that time, I was also doing my CIM, Chartered Institute Marketing. So I was studying for my marketing while I was working. And um, and then once I finished the contract world, I moved back up to Scotland. As you can tell, I'm from Scotland. <laughs> and I uh, got a job with a company called User Testing. Uh, User Testing was just launching their first EMEA office. So they decided, luckily for me, to have that in Edinburgh. So the office opened in the last June, July time. And since then, we've been working on the ground here because the, the company is actually... It's a tech firm that's based in San Francisco and Atlanta in the States. And this is the first time that we've been operating in Europe. So it's been a year now and it's been a fantastic, fast moving year. It's been scrappy marketing, but it's been very exciting. Um, and a little bit of information about the company. User testing is a platform. It uh, helps enable companies to really understand what they're customers think, feel, and do. So what we do is we help them basically bridge what we call the empathy gap. That Currently, there is around 75% of organizations who believe themselves to be empathetic to their customers. But when those same customers are asked, it's only around 30% that agree with that. So there's a massive gap there. And there's a lot of organizations that don't really know their customers anymore. And it's through multiple reasons, you know, we're getting very digital and sometimes we can lose that real human approach of how we market to people, how we talk to people. So the user testing platform really allows you to know exactly explicitly how they feel, what they're saying, and it's a very qualitative approach to research. Um, and we work with some of the biggest brands in the world and we work with small companies as well and we help them really understand their audience and it can be through, you know, for helping understand how their products work usability wise, or it could be a bigger brand feel of how do people feel about my brand. And we have a, a panel of over 1.5 million people worldwide who are already part of the user testing platform. So when you want to launch a test, you can easily reach your target audience and get results within a matter of two hours. And you would get a video back showing you exactly what your customer is going through, whichever test you wanted to look at, whatever research that you're looking for, you can get that all through user testing. So I became very passionate about the customer experience space through this role. And it's really made me understand as a marketer how important customer experience really is, because I don't think as marketers, we think about it as the same thing. Sometimes as customer experience, you think of service or you think of product and you think of design or you know uh, the product researchers you, you might not think of marketing except from the market research departments to really be focused on the customer experience but um it's very much shown light on the of how vital it is and it's a bit of a game changer at the moment so it's an interesting space to work in that's so exciting so wait how do you connect with the potential customers of these brands that you work with is it more like consultation or is it more like products? So you have one point, we have millions of users, basically, of testers around the world who receive a product and they can literally test it out, like kind of like the beta phase of that product. It can be that before it's launched, it can be when it's live. So really how it works is, you know, say your average person's just, you know, 
decide that they want to make a bit of extra money because we pay our testers and they go on to usertesting.com and you become a tester and your demographic all of your details you know get saved so for say for example if i was working for say nike and i wanted to test my product like my, my digital product says to buy on the app with a specific group of people in a specific area who buy nike So what we can do is we can actually find you that age, that location, a sex, anything that you're looking for in that area for you to be able to test that. So it may be, I want the tester to open this page, this first URL and do this action. And they'll be doing that and you'll see in real time what they're doing. So you'll be able to get, like they'll be talking over their experience and say, Rhett, I'm trying to do this. this. This is difficult. I don't quite understand why this is like that. And you're getting it out. You're seeing firsthand what your customer is going through and it's really powerful because I think you can have all the data in the world but if you don't know the why behind the what it does not it doesn't match up so it's a it's a fantastic tool and it's something that you you would have thought it's probably always been there it's it's a fantastic platform solution it's it's something that's a vital part of what we need to really connect with our customers and have become very passionate about that recently um is just from working at user testing because they really do live by what they say. You know, we talk to our customers all the time to make sure that we really know them as as much as we possibly can. Amy, I love this. Also because I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So you can imagine that I'm all about the UX. I used to be a, well, I was a founder of a tech platform. And for me during the beta phase, it was all about surveys at the end of the day, like interviewing my potential customer and seeing what they thought about my platform. I wish I would have known about user testing back in the day because I would have totally been your client. What about, yeah, sorry. (laughs) No, no worries. What about digital transformation? Can this also be used to help companies digitally transform like internally? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So digital transformation is a funny one. It's, you know, I feel like right now in the situation we're in, digital transformation is no longer a choice. (laughs) Like you've got to transform to digital (laughs) because right now we can't really be in the same place as our customers. And I know things are slowly kind of coming back to normal, but this has been a, a tough few months. And I think transformation can mean so many different things to so many different people internally. So you have a lot of discussions and back and forth of what transformation is going to mean for our organization when really all you could do is ask your customers what is really required here. How can we transform to help you get the answers back from your customers and let them be the change makers for you? And it just helps settle so many disputes internally. It's unbelievable. And you can really see like what is vital. Like maybe you don't need to transform. Maybe you just need to evolve. You know, I think the transformation word kind of scares everyone all the time, but this the platform user testing really can help you in the whole journey. You know, when you're trying to make sure if you're going the right road, if you're taking the right steps, user testing is right there with you to get fast feedback in two minutes, not two minutes, two hours. And you can get that straight away, go for your lunch, come back, and you've got the answers there from your target audience, whether or not you are in the right path. And it is a vital part because I think so many companies are so excited about that digital transformation, which is fantastic and and 100% should be excited about it. But you should also be checking yourself. You know, you should be also just looking back and taking a step back, thinking of the basics and going, right, is this really the right thing that we're doing? Uh, Are we making the right decision? Is this going to resonate with my customer? How is my customer going to feel about this? You know, you've really got to get into that because we we all know the amount of times that we've opened up a new app and it's been completely redesigned and we go, what? (laughs) This doesn't work for me, you know, and you stop using it and you just, you lose those customers. So. It's, it's vital. This is so exciting. So I possibly have a few potential clients that I'm going to be sending your way because I think they can definitely use user testing uh, in order to evolve, as you rightly said, because you're right. It's about evolution. Everybody has to evolve and companies do as well. So, yep. okay. Because we only have 20 minutes on the record. I mean, I could talk about user testing all day because I think it's such an exciting uh, service and product. But I do want to talk about your experience in brand marketing and also in thought leadership. And I'm going to stick to these two topics because it's your area of strength, as we touched upon before our interview. And I want to bring it down to the basics, okay? So to get this section of the interview started off, I'd like to ask for your advice on what you would tell startups that are just at the beginning phases of defining their brand. So in other words, how do you determine 
who your brand is because I mean, brands need to have a personality, right? But it's much easier to talk the talk than actually walk the walk. A lot of brands still don't know who they are and they're already a company. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting question because for, for a startup organization, it's so crucial to get it right early on. You know, when you're entering the market for the first time, you need to make sure that brand resonates with your audience. So I think there's there's always some fundamentals that you have to have from the get go. You know, you have to make sure you're being authentic and that you are matching up to expectations. You know, like if if you're providing a certain product and you're selling, you know, let's say, for example, you're selling uh um, clothes you know if it's just something like that if it's fashion so you're wanting something to really resonate and you have to have that you have to have that stand out but it has to be authentic and genuine so again like I kind of come back to the customer all the time like I'll always come back to the customers is if you've got that brand that's going to resonate it's going to create emotion with them you know if you're if you're selling fashion items and you really want a specific target audience to feel something different about your brand you have to stand out, you have to be genuine, you have to be authentic, but you have to also make sure it's matching your customer's expectations of when they buy that product. Is that matching what you're selling online? You know, is that brand matching what they get? When they get that delivery and they open that box and they look at what they've bought, is that matching how you've portrayed your brand? Is the design, the messaging, the positioning, is it all fitting together? you know, you have to be consistent as well. You know, I think I've seen a lot of brands from the get-go is it's decide what the vision is, decide what the positioning is, the brand message and the creative and everything and be consistent with it because changing too fast at the start will make it a little bit more confusing for your audience. So I think there's a few things that you have to get from the from the very beginning and, you know, I'm, I'm very much the advocate for testing. So make sure you test that brand, make sure you test that message with your audience, make sure you put it in front of real people, even if it's a mom test, you know, put it in front of your moms, put it in front of your aunties, but don't just push that into the market without getting that feedback. Yeah. What about like questions that every founder should ask himself or herself? It's an interesting one because, you know, I've not been a founder myself, so I can't say that I would know 100%, you know, what that would be from their perspective. Or every company. For example, I mean, I'm zooming into the startup world and ecosystem because I'm an entrepreneur at heart um, and I've had to go through all of these different hurdles and challenges of defining my brand, defining my voice, um, trying to reach, well, trying to have my brand produce emotions because I think it comes down to that. Um, and for a company to produce emotions, it's quite challenging. And so I think it comes down to fundamental questions as well regardless of if the company's a startup or if it's already in growth phase or a multinational, lots of companies redefine who they are along the way. So I would say from my, definitely my experience at user testing, because our CEO, Andy McMillan, is an incredible guy who I've never quite experienced a CEO like him in my life. And he really stands by the values of user testing. So I think really early on, if it's a founder or if it's an organization, whatever, or that might be someone senior um, in that company really has to ask themselves what are our key values because I see it and it does it trickles through from like what are the key values to how the leadership team stands by those values to how it then seeps into the organization and then how the employees display those to the customers and it's just this you know extreme trickle effect that's so powerful so I think because I see it in the leadership team that we have at user testing, it was really my very first experience of like, these are our values and we stick by them and we give them to our customers. And, you know, and they're, they're good values in the sense of we, one of them is get better. So like, we're always striving to get better. So you never want to necessarily get to a point and say, yep, yeah, we're done. <laughs> you know, you want to always have that ambition, the motivation and get to the next level. So I think get better is a really powerful one that we have at user testing. And we always have as like customers first, you know, think about the customer of any part of the organization you work in. If you're not thinking about the customer, that's going to make a negative impact on the business. And, and then also, I think you want to think about the way that you're talked about internally, you know, 
what do you want your employees to say about you externally? Because ultimately that's going to affect how they work with your customers and that's going to affect your sales and, and how you can grow and be successful, right? So I think that you want, you know, just how I'm saying to you about how amazing user testing is, like you want people saying that, you know, to everyone else. If you're a company right now, senior stakeholder, senior CEO, whatever you might be, you really want passion in your employees. So I think it's, it is labeling those uh, values and sticking by them, being consistent again, and making sure you're being genuine. You know, don't just slap some values on the wall and then don't live by them. You know, I think it's incredibly important to say what you're going to do and then do it. I agree. I actually work. Well, I'm head of business development at Vera Content, and Vera Content has very strong values. Culture. We're all about uh, culture and and making sure that our employees from down up, top down, feel proud of who we are and our service that we provide to our clients as well. And I think uh, feeling proud of the company that you work for is one of the best gifts that the company can give you beyond salary compensations and everything else, of course. Uh, But for me, I mean, I'm extremely proud of working with a company that stands in line with my own values on a personal level. And I know it has my back. And I I think that's part of the culture that they produce and some of the questions that founders have to ask themselves as well is how do you want employees to resonate with the company that they work with? So thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. What about the metrics? What metrics are important to you as a marketing director? So this is an interesting one because this is my first experience working in a fast growing SaaS business. So software as a service, um, as a as a tech platform, you know, it's a really interesting thing because we have such an important brand message and the thought leadership aspect of customer experience and how important that is. But from a marketing perspective, you're also sales best friends. So you have to really work directly with sales to make sure you're fully aligned on what the goals are for the business. So this has been a big learning curve for me, actually, you know, really into the lead generation part of business marketing. So it has been super exciting just learning how how to generate demand at scale. So I think when it comes to the metrics, yes, like you're looking at from a marketer's perspective in this sort of business, you're looking at the volume of of interest that you get from consumers that come in. And then you're looking at who those people are. So you're trying to make sure that you're getting our target audience correct. So you're looking at, we're getting these, you know, leads come through that match our target market that we're going after. And and then you want to just see like, what impact is your campaigns having on the actual business itself? You know, you might have held this most amazing event in the world, but if you didn't get any meetings or business out of that, you know, how successful really was it? So you really want to measure that up against the results. You know, you want to see from this campaign, we generate this amount of meetings and we generate this amount of revenue for the the business. Ultimately, that's how you know that your campaigns are working and they're actually helping the business. Because I think this, when it comes into the wider perspective and using platforms like user testing and checking that as marketers, we're not being overly biased and creating campaigns that we think are amazing, but no one else is necessarily agreeing with that. So you really need to fire into what is the the main goal here? Why are we going to spend this money on this campaign? And what kind of results are we going to generate from this? Um, For example, at the moment, we're doing a webinar series and it's getting, you know, very targeted across our demographics and it's generating a lot of great conversations with our sales team with our customer team and it's fantastic it's great to see that something on the back end of a campaign can really generate some some strong results so I think that it's been a big learning curve for me because obviously in the past it's been very brand focused and some brand tactics are harder to measure Um, but for me I think it's definitely coming down to what impact we've had on the business in terms of revenue but then also one thing I'll never sort of take for granted is this feedback that we get from customers. You know, after every campaign, we'll always ask for feedback. And did you enjoy that webinar? Did you enjoy that event? And, and it's qualitative and it's really important. You should never just rely on the big data. You have to get the real human insight to really understand if that was a really successful campaign or not. I love when marketeers speak about sales. Because I'm a very sales-oriented person. Obviously, I'm in business development, which is a mix of marketing and sales. Um, And I always think, well, I've always said that 
marketing is a tool to drive sales, but we cannot forget about sales because without sales, we don't have a company. I mean, you can promote and create the most beautiful campaigns in the world, but if they don't actually result in cash and in euros or in pounds or in, in dollars, the company's going to fold. So, so you, you've always got to have that commercial mindset, you know, especially in startup world. You've got to think like, what kind of revenue and results and leads can I generate from this campaign um, from the very beginning? No. And, and put it against the cost. Like how much are you investing to gain how many leads? What return on investment are we getting from, from this? You know, you, ha- you have to think about it that way. Definitely. Um, during the off record part of our conversation, you had mentioned that you're big in thought leadership. So I do want to talk about how you're incorporating thought leadership into your marketing strategy. Thought leadership is at the center of all of our activity, 100%, because I think you can be the best product in the world, but if nobody knows who you are, they're not just going to come knocking on your door and go, tell me about user testing. You really have to think about how you draw the interest in. And for that, we value thought leadership to the max. You know, we make sure that we're consulting with the best experts in the field. That We have a chief insights offer, Janelle Estes, that, that really does take responsibility and control to making sure that our thought leadership is beyond, you know, average. It's the, the top level, high quality things that we're creating in terms of, you know, resources and webinars and ebooks and events and you know, any sort of extra resources we create. We have, you know, a university that we actually help, you know, UX researchers and everyone learn more about how to do their jobs and, and how to help them actually advance. And it's it's things like that that I think become the most emotional drivers as a customer. You know, I know that it's any companies I work with as a marketer that really invest in the the extra more than just like the facts of the here's a sale, here's like what, what we're going to sell you. But what other valuable things can you give to me? Like, what other knowledge can I gain from this interaction? You know, and I, I see so much amazing content. Like, the content makes, like, this is great that you're getting, you know, the real voice of marketers to come on here and share their perspective. Like, this is valuable for other marketers. Like, I think that thought leadership should never be shied away from. But back to, the, you know, what we're saying and targeting, like, there's no point in going and creating some random thought leadership. You know, you really have to think about the audience, you know, is it a marketer? Do they live in Europe? What industry are they in? What challenges are they facing right now? And zone right into that specific area to create a piece of thought leadership on the back of that challenge or that pain point. Because ultimately, like, if people are thinking, like, okay, I need more resources to figure out how to be better at my job, they're going to be searching that online. And you want that to come up. You know, you want that that content to be popular. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's great for lead generation demand generation but it's also just fantastic is like for internal purposes as well for helping your company really understand what you're all about you know for for me like we've got so much great stuff and spent a lot of time reading at the beginning so it's uh it's incredibly helpful internally and externally Amy, well, thank you for that shout out. (laughs) We appreciate it. (laughs) And I'm very happy that you like what we're doing and think that it provides value to our audience as well. Um, So I want to talk about some real life examples that you admire, that inspire you in terms of marketing campaigns. And this will basically help our audience to understand how some of the talk can be applied to the walk. So yes, I had a little think about this one. So one one of the the campaigns that struck out to me the most during this whole COVID crisis, because if you think about it, it was kind of like battle battle of the marketers during this COVID crisis. You know, <laughs> you know emails and, and ads and everything. And a company that really stood out to me massively it was Skyscanner because I think their hashtag We Will campaign resonated I mean even thinking about it I've got a little bit goosebumps you know it's, it massively resonated with me because travel right now is so emotional you know the thought of not being able to travel to see your best friend that lives in another country or you know be it like I've got family that live all over the world and if you're not able to go and visit them right now and you're not able to go and experience you com- like countries and cultures right now it's it's upsetting you know and I think it was that hope that Skyscanner gave us in the campaign 
And I'll always say this, you know, the, the most successful campaigns are ones that trigger emotion. Like you have to trigger emotion. And that one certainly did. You know, it was giving you that hope that we will travel again and we will we will come out the end of this. Like we've all got to be hopeful and we're going to get through this. And it really resonated. And I think they had fantastic results from it. People just talking about it and trending and and sharing it online because I think it really did strike a chord with quite a lot of people. So off the top of my head, that was, you know, a big campaign uh, that struck it to me during this time. But um, fundamentally, yes, I would say that the best marketing campaigns are the ones that can trigger emotion. And that doesn't have to be sadness. It can be joy and laughter and it can be anything that really just makes that person remember you later because you made them feel something. Amy, I mean, you're giving me the chills just talking about it. I'm (laughs) a frequent traveler, unfortunately, not during Corona times because, of course, I've been extremely limited um, and also quite scared, to be honest. Uh, Spain was heavily affected and uh, we faced lots of deaths uh, from coronavirus. So I've been trying to stay away from airports and planes lately. But just the idea of being able to jump on a plane again and, like you said, travel across the world to see some of my best friends who live in the U.S. and not being able to do so, but having that hope that one day I'll be able to, one day in the near future, (laughs) let's specify in the very near future, I'll be able to jump on that plane again and go out to LA and just see some of my closest friends. So yeah, it's about creating emotions. But what about when those emotions are negative emotions? How would you respond to customers who are giving negative social media reviews about your service, product, platform? What do you do in that case? You know, you're you're never going to please everyone. You know, there's always going to be someone that's got a little gripe or something, and and usually it's those folk that like to go on social media and complain. And I think it just depends on what's being said. You know, if there's a legitimate problem, if someone's having problems with the product and someone sees that, we immediately flag it to our product team who get in touch with those people to see, you know, how they can help. Um, so if it's a genuine problem, you know, we try to be responsive. We've got a, a social team that is constantly watching our channels and making sure that the interactions are positive mainly. But if there's any negative reactions, we are we are being responsive. You know, the, probably the worst thing you can do is ignore them all. You know, if, if you do have something that's coming up and again and again, like don't just ignore it, address it. Try and figure out if there's something that's trending and becoming like a clear issue, take it back internally and go, right, in the last month, we've had these negative reviews are all linked to this one theme. Let's take some time to think about what this is and how we can fix it. You know, like take a take a our, our CMO Michelle Huff is is very optimistic all the time and always um, refers to problems as problem opportunities. You know, like turn that op- like that problem into an opportunity. Like think about what else we could, we could change. Like if you're getting a lot of negative reviews that are specific to the product, maybe there's a bit of the usability that you need to change maybe you have to get user testing and do some testing you know like do something like that to make a positive impact and actually from the negative review create something beautiful maybe something like that (laughs) I love that it's like that phrase that I used to be told when I was little turn that frown upside down (laughs) put a smile on (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay well we are moving into our set of rapid fire questions which are basically your recommendations for our audience so to get this section started off i'd like to talk about a resource or an influencer that inspires you a resource and influencer uh, that inspires me okay um i would say as much as i can disagree with him a lot uh mark ritson is definitely someone that i follow because I think he does call it out like it is, but there's a lot of things he says I disagree with. So I would say like he's a great influencer for marketers to kind of step back from the bull sometimes, you know, like to be real, to be genuine. So off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's lots more that I could think of. (laughs) Okay, what about a book, a publication, or an event that you'd like to recommend to our audience? So um, recently just went to an event and I know they do regular events. Um, Madfest uh, recently held an event called the 99 Club uh, digital event. So that was a great way to do a digital trade show. It was very short, snappy content and everyone had 99 seconds to really give their big idea. So that was a great uh, event. Um, 
in terms of other resources, um, you know, I definitely get a lot of content from Marketing Week, like some of the big uh, marketing publications, like they're, you know, there's always trending pieces that you can get into and just see who other people are talking about specific pro- projects, etc. So I would say I go to that quite regularly um, and kind of try and read a little bit of, you know, self-development stuff that's not necessarily linked to marketing but you can really help it just change all aspects of how you work in your career and how you work with your colleagues. The the one book I always recommend is The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. And it's just a really strong piece of literature that makes you think like there's just little small things I can make huge difference in my life. And um, I think that you can really pull that into how you are in your career. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for that advice. What about your favorite app at the moment and why? It can be for personal reasons or for personal use as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think my favorite app for personal use right now is TikTok. <laughs> but it's um, it's mainly, I don't put anything on there. I just like to look at it because I'm fascinated by humans. You know, I think that we're all weird and wonderful and there's some weird and wonderful stuff on there right now and I think it's just during the same everyone's been in lockdown and the content on there is just second to none you know you've got some incredible talented artists and singers and dancers and then you have got like comedians and it's just I feel like it's a great snappy way of getting content it's been um been fun to watch it Uh, I'm not sure how long I'll continue to watch it I'm not sure how I would incorporate it as a brand but um I do I do enjoy it yeah no I think it's a great laugh I find it extremely entertaining as well um I'm very interested to see how brands are going to incorporate it into their social media strategy because I don't know how business to business company would do that I see more for b2c uh, but let's see. I mean, the future is full of surprises as coronavirus has ta- taught all of the marketeers across the world and professionals yeah. from all industries as well. Okay, well, that was Amy. Amy, thank you so much for sharing those great tips with us. It was a pleasure to have you on the content mix and your insights were very valuable. So I look forward to following your journey across your social networks as well. I'll be connecting with you soon on LinkedIn. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was great. Thank you. And to everyone listening into the content mix today, thank you so much for joining us as well. For more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, check out the content mix. We'll be releasing interviews just like this one every week. So keep on tuning in. Thanks again and see you next time. Bye. Bye.